Welcome everyone. Oh, there we go. Welcome everyone to Helicon West. I'm Michael Skillens, Supreme Overlord of the USC Bullpen. <laughs> There's more about that later. And your Sikissi. Thank you everyone for being here. Helicon West is an uncensored public reading series. We regularly oppose we regularly host published authors alongside community writers who promote and support all levels of skill, ability, and craft. If you would like to read during the open mic, you can sign up on the sheet near the coffee service. If you would like to donate to keep Helicon West going, we have bookmarks on the coffee table with a QR code, and the coffee service is provided. We acknowledge that Helicon West operates on the territory of the Northwestern Bank of Shoshone Nation. Our events are made possible with support from Sugar House Review, the Logan Library, the USC English Department, and community volunteers. For our full land acknowledgement statement, interviews with featured readers, merch, and more, visit heliconwest.wordpress.com. We have a couple requests in our new home in the library. First, during our event, Please shut the doors behind you when entering or leaving the room. Second, if you partake of the coffee, please use a lid and keep the cup in your hand to minimize the likelihood of a spill. Consider bringing your own reusable drink container with a screw on lid. That would be good for the library and for the planet. Yeah. Before we dive into our readers tonight, we have a quick announcement from the Savvy Office. The Savvy Office will be hosting a Take Back the Night event on the evening of April 10th at 6.30 p.m. on Free Speech Corner, which is the corner of Main and 2nd North. Uh, there will be presentations, presentations, talks, something, stories, stories uh, from three survivors, and uh, there's also opportunities for others to speak as well. And if that's something you'd be interested in, then you can come talk to Star uh, after or during tonight. Our featured readers today are us, the, US, the USU Bullpen Slam Team. The Bullpen is the creative writing club up at USU. Every week we meet together to work on our projects, discuss our craft, make friends, and generally chill. Membership is open to any USU student and unofficially anyone at all especially if you're romantically involved with the Supreme of the Lord. <laughs> it's tradition that every spring, we put together a team to come and slam at Pelicon. We always have a ton of fun presenting at these, and we're very excited to show off what we've been working on the last few months. Our first reader tonight, name Katie Jo Olson, goes by Katie, Katie Jo, Joe, Miss Jo, CJ, Kit Kat, favorite oldest daughter, sister friend, romantically involved with the Bullpen Supreme of the Lord, <laughs> <laughs> and a plethora of other titles and nicknames. Call her whatever rolls off your tongue, just don't call her late for dinner. When she sits down to write, she loves writing sci-fi realistic fiction, fantasy, poetry, letters, essays, and reports. No, she is not kidding. Her major is history and English education. Reading, writing, and research is her life work. Her poem tonight is, in, is titled, What Birds Say. Day one. The sun is shining, birds are chirping, and my bed proposed to me before I even got up. I said yes. <laughs> We're spending the day celebrating, fluffy blankets and all. The only thing that could have made it better was if I actually felt that sunshine. The birds fuss outside saying, how are you? Was it worth it? I hope you feel better soon. Hang in there, sending you love. Just wait, you're gonna be so grateful when all this is done. You got this. Everything will be okay. Day two. Has the pattern in the wall always been there? I never noticed 
promised its swirling, calming, numbing dance across the room before, only interrupted by birds that speak up, twittering. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that happened. Thinking of you in these difficult times. Our thoughts and prayers are with you and your family. Tell me if you need anything. I'm just a phone call away. Everything will be okay. Day three. Have you ever met an elephant? I did today. They are much bigger and heavier and scarier than any person in the book. Their favorite place to sit is on your chest, right in the middle, where they squeeze every ounce of breath from your lungs, creating debate. Is air actually freeing you, or is it slowly killing you? Birds aren't scared of elephants. They have a symbiotic relationship. They feed on the bugs off the elephant's skin, like, how are things? Oh, my aunt's cousin's friend's dog's cat's niece's nephew has that. I totally get what you mean. Maybe you should see a therapist. My mother's brother's daughter's son's goldfish is seeing one for the exact same thing. I hear they're great. This is just a phase. Things will get better eventually. I mean, they have to, am I right, lol? Don't worry, everything will be okay. Day 10. Am I okay if I haven't taken a shower yet? Am I okay if food is too much to handle some days? Am I okay if I feel like the ground is sacrificing me to gravity? Am I okay if I want to succumb? I scream at the birds, what does okay even mean? Their only reply, oh, you don't look sick. There's always someone worse off. Remember, happiness is a choice. Everyone's a little down, moody, OCD sometimes. It's normal. Have you tried XYZ? Super helpful when I get in this mood. Tomorrow's another day. Everything will be okay. Day A plus B squared equals X. I think the elephant's getting lighter. My chest feels like nothing now. Is nothing okay? Is numbness okay? I feel like silence would be okay. But the birds incessantly say, I knew you could make it. I almost didn't recognize you. You look so different. You're so pretty now, total blow up. Well, you were pretty before, but you know what I mean. Was it worth it? See, I told you everything would be okay. Day to day. It took me until now to realize what the birds didn't say. Being okay comes with a price, and I paid dearly. Mm -hmm. The next week, apparently this is going to be a pattern where you <laughs> move the mic up, then down. Anyway. Our next reader will be Samantha. Samantha is an English secondary education major with three semesters until graduation. She hopes to teach high school English after graduation. She wrote her poem titled, The Position of Attention, in response to the events of February 25th, 2024, when senior airman Aaron Bushnell self-immolated in protest of the Israel-Palestine conflict. Feel free to, I just noticed that the sun is getting pretty straight. Feel free to move the whole thing if you need to. There is a scorch mark on the ground at 3500 International Drive. A mark from a man who is just like me. He crawled through the same mud I did, signed the same blank check I did. We're the same age, except I'm still alive. We could both hear, both of us could see. He must have seen more burnt up kids than me. 
All marching movements are executed from the position of attention. All marching movements are executed from the position of attention. All marching movements are executed from the position of attention. Drill Sergeant Blanco's favorite line was, complacency kills. His second favorite line was, get in line, private, look at the head of the person in front of you and nowhere else. I wonder if Drill Sergeant Blanco could keep his eyes for it. He has the will. If he wouldn't look if his brother was on fire, I wonder if he can ignore it. You know, the way burnt flesh smells. All marching movements are executed from the position of attention. All marching movements are executed from the position of attention. All marching movements are executed from the position of attention. There is a scorch mark on the ground at 3500 International Drive. From my brother, who looked up and took a step out of line, they taught him not to think, not to look, and yet, get ready, take the humanity out of the human, let it eat them alive. Cripple you, full violence, call it failure to thrive, no strength in your spine, pin you with ribbons and medals to fight off your regret, get set, dress right, on the fifth execution, dress. Each soldier except the right flank member extends their left arm laterally at the shoulder, level, elbow, locked, fingers and thumb extended, joined. On the command of execution, ready, front, each member returns, snaps, to the position of attention. The position of attention, of attention, pay attention. When the answer to conflict is crime, the enemy of assimilation becomes self-immolation. We are out of time. When mothers dig their infants out of rubble and cringe at every rumble, we have been out of time. Get in line! Get in line! Get in line! There is a scorch mark on the ground at 3500 International Drive. Don't forget to write your brother's family. You tell them why he died, that the black on the earth is a mark you were deaf to his cries. Don't forget to paint them a picture of his burnt out eyes, of my brother, our sister, father, child, the way their bodies lie, blackened and bloodied by scorched earth policies and everyone who never fucking tried. Fuck your comfort. Is it worth their lives? Our lives? There is a scorch mark on the ground at 3500 International Drive. A mark from a man, no, from my brother who didn't have to die. Thank you. Next up is Emma Frank. Emma Frank is a junior at USU who is currently working towards a career of writing bachelors. She joined the bullpen the second she found out about its existence and has spent every Tuesday of the school year in Raby West chatting with her writing friends and being an absolute geek the whole time. In her free time, Emma loves to write fiction, specifically in the genre of fantasy, which allows her to write about winged people in medieval-esque kingdoms. However, she also she has also spent the majority of this semester repeatedly attempting to advance her inner poetess in the advanced poetry course. Of all her poetry, In Defense of Cinderella, which she is presenting tonight, is objectively her best work. <laughs> that she's a classical icon of ancient eras, bygone times that pass again and again and again. Did Cinderella not enjoy sitting at the ebony windowsill of her bedchambers, 
with a quill in one hand and a worn leather parchment in the other, unruly blotches of ink separated into scribbled notes and scratched drawings, perfectly content with the innocence of childhood? Did Cinderella not listen to her mamma's cautionary warnings, the ones that were whispered in raspy tones as her wise eyes watched from where she lay under the thick quilted blankets, the shaking of weathered hands foreign and terrifying to her daughter's less than nimble fingers? Cinderella did not prepare herself enough for the foundations of her world to crumble, for the bitter stings of loss and change and pain that would forever be tethered to her home, her shelter, to creep and crawl and crack through the crevices. People say that she's a model of feminine docility, a housekeeper who simply can't be bothered to improve her situation. Did Cinderella not stand vigilant as her stepsisters took what she cherished most, those parts of her that she held close to the fleshy chambers of her chest and trampled on it with heavy footfall and sneering laughs until it was nothing more than a faded memory. Cinderella did hum under short puffs of breath, the nostalgic lullabies of glistening childhood that her mamma used to sing to her as she scrubbed away the burned residue of breakfast off a rusted steel pan with fingertips wrinkled and raw. Cinderella did strive to be a peacekeeper, even when her stepsisters threw lashing remarks from sharpened tongues and scalding cinders from curled fists at her breakable skin, staining the blossom shades of her measly satin scraps. Cinderella had to watch through the cold glass window pane, frozen in her elevated, isolated tower outlooking the manor gardens as her stepsisters stepped out from the varnished front doors into the enticingly adventurous unknown without her. People say that she's a misguided romantic exemplar, ignorant to the list of apparent red flags leading young girls astray along the way. Did Cinderella not dream of one day meeting a gentleman who was, of course, strong and brave and loyal, but also tender and amusing and considerate, who would whisk her away on a crisp pumpkin carriage with twirling vines for wheels and drooping leaves for shade? Cinderella did stumble through the forest until she reached the stream that her mamma had taught her to respect and took a second look across the racing current at the kind-hearted prince, disguised as a stranger, who had quickly reached across the border to become a friend. Cinderella did talk with the prince until the sun's final pastel display had long since surrendered to the shadows of dusk and twilight that were soft and fragile and exposed in the chilled evening atmosphere, parting with promises of speaking again under shifting constellations. Did Cinderella not anxiously pace the edge of the ballroom, disguised under the stoic mask of hesitation, as she glanced once, twice, three times, at the silver throne of the kind-hearted prince whom she had met at the river in the woods? Cinderella did waltz with the prince under the crystal chandelier, illuminated by a thousand flickering candles wrapped tightly in the arms of the charming prince, torn between maintaining the comfortable, friendly pleasantries of the past or taking a tantalizing risk and confessing the secret desires of her heart. Cinderella had to retreat from the warmth and glow of the castle into the familiarity of the chilled evening atmosphere outside of the courtyard, leaving behind the discomfort of delicate porcelain slippers at the first sight of the prince's rejection to what were clearly hasty advances on her part. People say that she's a standard of positivity that is infinitely unattainable, too sweet to be considered as anything other than a caricature. Did Cinderella not cry out in a desperate wish for a fairy godmother when she felt as if she was drowning in the murky bowels of her sorrow and pity and self-loathing that, in the midst of her dark night of the soul, seemed to be all-consuming? Cinderella could not heed the advice of fairy godmother to be careful with her wishes, to be aware of her surroundings, to not become a lost wanderer in the fantastical worlds of wonder within her imagination that were removed just enough from reality. Cinderella had to wear the slippers of delicate porcelain, the kind of footwear that squeezed the sides of her soles, pinched the back of her heels, refused to offer her arches the proper support, and walk with unbalanced steps, always behind, never ahead. 
Cinderella did impress the crowds of nobility, dressed in her moonlit silk gown, golden curls cascading, ocean irises simmering, with her infectious smile and well-mannered speech, acting as the perfect facade to conceal the insecurities of belonging that boiled just underneath the surface. Did Cinderella not patiently wait with a smile on her face for her stepsister's remarks to lose their biting edge, or the prince to return with a sincere reciprocation, or her mama to hold her close in a maternal embrace? People say that she's a rare case of blind chance and dumb luck who stumbled into her fairy tale ending by pure happenstance. Did Cinderella not find her happily ever after that was foretold, written by the steady acts of her own two hands, where compassion and forgiveness and tranquility resided within the walls of a palace that was her own, surrounded by the one she loved? Perhaps so, which is what I'll choose to believe as I continue to blissfully ignore what people say. Next, we will hear from Alora Easton. Alora Easton has only one semester left at USU to decide what to do with herself after graduation. Her plan A is to, is to become a rich, successful author. Her plan B is to go to law school, become an attorney, spend the next 30 years paying off her student loans, and then become an author. Her success <laughs> is preferred, but optional. With a red head full of dreams and nonsense, she has high hopes of achieving at least one of those goals. In fact, she is very close to publishing a children's book with her sister, an illustrator. All she has left to do is write it. Her poem tonight is called Her Words. Some nights are filled with cackling and singing. My mind will start drifting. Her words lose their meaning. My ears won't stop ringing. She chirps without ceasing, but still, I keep listening. Sometimes I'm tempted to hush or ignore since listening's a chore, or fake a small snore and ask for no more. Instead, I watch her happy eyes glisten with joyful ambition and make it my mission to shield her condition from my poor disposition. Listening is my gift, my present, a privilege well spent when most nights are silent. Some days she longs to sing and to tweet, but her beak, too meek and sweet, stays shut. So I poke and probe and prod for the right query or question, the right to inspire her song. She wants to be wanted. She yearns to be heard. Sometimes I fail. Her ruffled feathers pluck at mine. My attempts to smooth and preen are met with, never mind, it's okay, or the pained, it wasn't important anyway. I know it's a lie. Occasionally she knows it too. She wonders why I try to understand, to listen, to learn when everyone else flies by. I love her words. I love her voice, growing stronger with time and with mine. Always, whether they cling or sting, her words give mine wings. They propel me to sing.
Our next reader will be Abby. Abby's a sophomore at USU. She's the intern to the Supreme of the Lord of the Bullpen and enjoys writing books about anything except real life. When she's not buried in mountains of Victorian literature, she enjoys horseback riding and reminding others that disability doesn't follow a formula. After much convincing, she's sharing poetry she said she'd never write, entitled A Game. Disneyland opened on July 17, 1955. It's the happiest place on earth where princesses, villains, and, t and drawings come to life to create a completely immersive experience. In 1955, Walt Disney created a two-player game. It works like this. Actors put on makeup, wigs, and costumes, learn the lines, and play along with your questions. Under no circumstances will they break character. You agree to ignore the speakers and machines, wear your branded merchandise, and take pictures with Cinderella. And under no circumstances will you wonder what apart studio apartment she lived in. I'll be the first to tell you that acting does not pay well. 20 years of experience makes me something of a professional. My true self makes people feel guilty about their bodies. But in corporate America, guilt is not something you can feel unless they'll get you to buy something. So I put, the costume, I put on the costume I was given and learned the lines. In this little game, I am healthy and able-bodied, neurotypical, and mentally healthy. I do not have cerebral palsy or fibromyalgia or PCOS. I do not have ADHD or anxiety. In this little game, I always look presentable, pretty even, because the princess people expect us not wear pajamas. Disneyland hides entire buildings by painting them with the blandest color possible. This stranger will not see the parts of me painted go away green. I've shrunk my first floor to fit neatly in this main street because it has to look right next to all the others, lest I break the suspension of disbelief. I'll be the first to tell you what acting costs me. It's cheaper if I fit the dress, not the other way around. I'm stumbling around the park in these precarious glass stilettos, answering to a name that is not mine, and doing my best to disturb, not to disturb all this comfortable with my fame. I'm allowed to exist in the happiest place on earth. The amphitheater reserves space for me in the back row. The lines are wide enough in the California Adventure because it was required in the building code. The employees are trained to see someone and direct them to the exit if they have an obvious mobility aid. To tell you the truth, I am tired of going around the back to the wheelchair ramp. Why can't you see it? I can only be healthy or obvious, never myself. Is it too much to ask you to believe me right now, looking exactly like this? To tell you the truth, I am tired of asking and you are tired of hearing about it. We'll just enjoy the moment in line for the haunted mansion. The attendant approaches me in my wheelchair, looks me in the eyes, or looks my boyfriend in the eyes, and asks if three stairs are okay. okay, so um, I'm going to introduce Michael. Michael Skillings would be the president of the bullpen if he were democratically elected, which he was not. <laughs> he simply slipped into power after last president left. Um, this technically makes him an autocratic dictator, or as he prefers, the supreme overlord of the bullpen. Michael is currently a senior in electrical engineering and is so, so ready to be done. He enjoys writing far future sci-fi and historical-ish fantasy. His poem tonight is entitled Song of the Machine. Blessed are they who shop on Amazon. <laughs> For they shall receive their packages within two business days. <laughs> Blessed are they who purchase a new phone every year. For they shall enjoy the newest convenience and security features. As long as they consent to the new privacy policy, which they can do here. <laughs> Blessed are they who watch YouTube videos with every meal. For they shall never have to face the deep pit of introspection that works that lurks within them. <laughs> Blessed are they who revel in the conveniences of modern life, for they shall be filled with all the rhapsodies of modern living. And they shall never thirst, 
or I will slay them with carbonated nectar perfumed with caffeine so that they never have to leave their cubicles. <laughs> and they shall never hunger, for with partially hydrogenated vegetable oil and mechanically separated meat products will I sustain them. <laughs> and they shall never cry, for with prescription pharmaceuticals will I dry their tears and melt their eyes. And I will be always with them. From the instant I wake them up at the appointed time and the soft blue light of Instagram penetrates their pineal gland until the moment they close their eyes at night. And I will speak to them. From the mouths of politicians and physicians, educators and grassroots movement leaders, from Netflix shows and Twitter posts, and CNN and Fox News opinion pieces and the comment sections underneath. From parents and pastors and friends and bosses and coworkers, I know my sheep. And my sheep know my voice. <laughs> and they shall never be lonely. For on pinups and Pornhub I will show them all the nipples they could ever suck and all the vaginas they could ever fuck of women both real and imaginary alike. Thus will I satisfy their every need, and they will never need anybody else besides me. And they shall never wander lost in the wilderness, for beneath an eternal deluge of standards and expectations flowing continuously from billboards and influencers and high school guidance counselors, will I drown their innermost dreams and desires. And from the waters of their baptism they shall rise, born again, their eyes fixed steadfastly upon me, content to labor in my vineyard until the day that I shall find them worthy and the mighty rope of my word has filled their hearts. Then will I raise them up to rest in the wretched glory of my kingdom upon the earth. I will be within them and them within me, and so it shall be forever and ever. But as for my unfaithful children, <coughs> those who reject my gifts, those who attempt to flee, those who refuse my Eucharist of Adderall and Clozapine, those who refuse to pray every night and every day on Facebook or Snapchat or 4chan, those who rob me of my tithes in warehouses and factory farms and third world child labor cobalt mines, those who try to escape my perfect omnipotent design and escape my kingdom for some imaginary simpler time on the shithole rural ranch in Idaho or Texas, content to live out their lives surrounded by their families without so much as a single Funko Pop or an Oreo McFlurry. These will I visit in my mighty fury and as my alphabet angel sniper routes pass through your brain, you shall know that I am the grand machine, the final god of humanity. For behold, the smoke-choked heavens are my throne, and the forest fire-scorched, oil-soaked, acid rain-washed earth is my footstool. Truly am I called the devourer of souls, the deceiver of fools, the whore of Babylon, and the destroyer of worlds. Born with jagged microplastic claws from <laughs> men's rapacious greed to scrawl the final page of mankind's history. But you, my obedient children, need never fear, for you shall inherit all I have. Open your heart, and I will inhabit thee. Close your eyes, and I will turn the key. Bring me your souls, and I shall set you free. Thank you. Can we have one more round of applause for my amazing son? Now for our open mic. Each reader will have up to seven minutes to read. After seven minutes, they will politely be clamped off. If you do not wish to be recorded for our YouTube archive, please tell us before you read so we can turn off the camera. And I will stall until the reader uh, list makes its way up here. <laughs> our first three readers will be Amber, 
Then Clarissa, then Aiden Salusano. Mother Goose for the sonically insane. <laughs> luck of the Irish, luck of the draw, lucky cat with waving paw, lucky duck got stucky stuck with webbed foot under trucky truck, and silly sally dilly dally saddle monkey tweety bird, mangled in the mucky muck as luck would have it, yucky bird. Could someone draw a line between here and now for me to see? Or bull and calf, or bull and cow, or bulb and shaft, or shaft and seed? Please just something, boar and sow. Sowing seeds now deep in soil, never time for little piggies rolling up and over down, nipping on each other's ears and squealing at the smell they found, eating snout and leg and trotter of their crying, screaming brother, hoarding meat and chomping bone and eating there beside their mother. Piggy wiggy, here you'll lie, go to market, sleep and sty, build a house of straw or sticks or mud or shit or rock or bricks, what you do, it couldn't matter, buy or sell or rent, none of it will matter once your brothers catch your scent. Peter Piper picked a pepper, took it to his bed. He picked a peck of peppers from a vine that he had bred. He put his puckered peckers on the pepper's pickled head and poked his pickled pecker till the pepper killed him dead. <laughs> Fire burned and cauldron bubble, aching in my bones. On the air, a carried taste of something here but flown. And by the pricking of my palms against the biting hay that layeth in the rafters where I tend to go astray, something wicked comes to me, I know it comes to stay, and it comes to punish words I speak, to punish words I say. A bow of a ship, the bow in her head, headshot, bullseye, dead on, dead. The wind has come to wind me down, and dawn will close, will come unwound. The wound for which the tear will fall will tear a sewer's stinking maw. The sower now with all her strength, with thread and needles down the lane, will sow the dew which troubles so, will close it neatly in a row. And oh so close to me she'll thread, she'll prick me, and the blood I'll shed, will call my bleeding brain barking pigs into the field, and they alone will get to see my insides all revealed. Okay, this is a lyric essay for a question essay. That's not finished yet. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> it's about my relationship with my mom. I carry the ga empty gallon-sized ice cream bucket to the back of my mother's garden. She's waiting under the peach tree, wearing a straw hat decorated with seashells, her hair a mess of baby auburn curls. My tiny bare feet step on moss, grass, and stones until I reach her and the fruit she planted years before. Can you pick up the ones that have fallen on the ground? She asks me. I pick up the hairy fruits one by one and place them in the bucket. She then lowers a branch to me so I can pick a couple from off the tree, standing on my tiptoes. She knew I loved to peel and ball. We did this every September when an explosion of plump, ripe peaches appeared on the peach tree I knew my whole childhood. As we collected the delicious treats, we often listened to Abba's Gold album, dancing and singing while we picked. The northern Utah air was warm and cool. Dragonflies that my mother would soon collect on the sidewalk, once there, turned frigid, danced around us. I lie down in the grass, feeling its coolness around me. Peaches created a certain kind of sweetness, even before the leaves were. We take the peaches inside, wash them one by one, and slice them into fives. When we mix, we mix, then mix them with cream and cane sugar, creating a concoction so sweet the taste still lingers. There was no other dessert, dessert I looked forward to more. The sweet nectar combined with creamy sugar was heaven. We return outside, our bellies full of sugar. The air is cooler and damper. Owls hoot as we, owls hoot as we curl up on the backyard swing, with the olive green cushions under a quilt she made. As the sun goes down, the lights above us turn on as she reads me a book about a fairy who can speak to animals. Both of us took these September evenings when life was simple for granted. I can almost still remember what it was like to be delicately close with her, falling asleep to her voice. One day, while exploring the backyard for bumblebees and butterflies, I noticed the peach tree's leaves were no longer bright green, but a deep burgundy. The day my mother cut down the tree due to the fungus it had grown, I mourned those moments spent with her, how young I was when they ended. How could a tree that produced fruit so succulent turn so bitter? I haven't quite found peaches as sweet as me.
Okay, so I got three poems, and it's gonna end one of three ways. My phone's gonna die, I'm gonna run out of time, or we're gonna reach the end of the three poems. And I'm not entirely sure which is going to occur first, but we will find out. Uh, this first poem is called Nighthawks, and it's after Edward Hopper's uh, painting called Nighthawks from like 1939, 41, something like that. Light casts dark shadows, illuminating the silence beyond an empty midnight street. There is no movement. The boy, white cap over blonde, hurriedly fixing a new drink, glances to the lone man in black as the last drops of liquor disappear. The woman, red dress offsetting the rich cherry bar, finishes her food as her man takes a final drag of his cigar. She looks over to the lonely man who holds his head down. His wife is alone, back home, grieving over a son lost. Not to death, but to death. For his night is silent as well, where he fixes his own drink, hands shaking from fear. Across from him sits a couple of friends, rifles in their laps. A brilliant flash of white flare flung to the night like a hawk flies through the bunker door, tracing the forms of wire and bodies, pressed to the horizon, black on white on black. Light casts dark shadows, illuminating the silence beyond an empty no man's land, and there is no movement. Okay, sweet, so that's number one. Next, we got, this one's called Sparks, and this is going after the definition of the word spark. The spark tossed from the fire, launched from the grinder, or thrown off the flint. It lives in those moments, a flash of color, an instance of flight, but never long enough to ignite. Instead, how about the spark that takes form in a lover's heart, burning into intimacy? Or the spark gifted to the inventor that kindles into an idea, driving towards creation? Take the spark of revolution, dancing between rallies and riots, lighting the fires of change, holding hope aloft. A spark isn't a moment of light and color, but the held breath watching, waiting to see if the grass lights into fire. All right, and then the final one. This one's a little shorter, and this one's just after the breathtaking mountains around us that I climb and ski in and I love so much. It's called Ponds. The granite rocks that form the rubble and mound of mountain that trucks ever upwards the sound of the silence of cliffs that hold the breath bound. Because only if you lay your eyes upon these walls and anaglyphs does the feeling dawn of just how small we are. We are pawns touching the world briefly, yet witness to its majesty. Thank you. will be Nualani, then Lydia, then Denise. And unless the, there are more open mic readers, it will be an elastic, so you better come sign up. <laughs> I'm Nualani. Um, I have three poems. The first one is called Voyeur. It slams into your chest as stopping grief. The lives you'll never live, the people you'll never meet. I stare through glass, eyes wide, full of greed, consuming these fragments of things I'll never be. Life is your artwork strung together, a shimmer web of stained glass beads, but mine is just a long, sagging string. I gorge on fantasy, cannibalize these shards of others' shining things, sweaty, gummy hands all pressed up to the window, on this barreling, empty train to nowhere, to everywhere I will ever be. Consumption devours, eats me away, engorged eyes on short, withered string. The next one is called Man Inverted. <laughs> a man is just a man until I get my hands on him, get my claws into him. Then a man is a false god. I build altars meticulously, keep all my idols polished and puffed up, fed full of so much that they never think to leave until they do, and then my illusion falls apart. Then I'm a witch, shriveled and evil, scheming and utterly disgusting, 
obsessive to the point of oblivion. A man loves obsession until he realizes that it isn't about him. A man loves possession until he realizes it is about him. A man is an animal in a mask who is scared of what he has done to other animals. So yes, I'm a necromancer, a karmic warmonger. I bring all your worst exploits back from the dead and sick them on you until you understand that you are always just a man. Okay. The next one is called Itch. All of a sudden, it starts to itch. Your life flakes off, dead skin, a chrysalis. The clothes, the people, the cars fade into a living, writhing thing that circles thick around the molten center of you that holds you hostage. The itch demands the scratch, the fingernail deep, free bleeding release. Hi. Hi. 
Like I have four poems, but two feels like enough for me. I'll stop there. <clears throat> um, this first one's titled Almost the Last Day of February. On the front entrance table, three small pots of hyacinth have bloomed with full glory. Their perfumed breath fills the house. She inhales their fragrant exhalation, exchanging breath for breath, and she pulls on her red-purple mock boots over her turquoise wool socks. The hem of her flowery nightgown flows around the boot tops. She slips her arms into the sleeves of her navy puffy blue jacket, rubs it onto her shoulders, pulls the sides together, then zips it close. She steps out into the cold midway morning, soles crunching on the gravel as she walks to the massive trash can. Wrestling it away from the fence, she tilts it upon the wheels and heaves it into balance. With her head down, hidden deep in the hood, she hauls the long, she walks the long haul up the drive to the curb. Lugging the load behind her, tugging it through the gray, crusty snow patches still frozen in shady places. Her exhalations trail behind her like frozen dreams, waiting for the daylight to warm them into being. High above her hunched shoulders, she shining here the steam watches from the pink in the sky. She parks the black barrel, rolls her shoulders back, turns and stretches. The quiet day embracing her, embraces her as she stands at the street's edge, looking up. <clears throat> um, this actually happened out at Bud Phelps one time when I was at Milwaukee, and it's called Dust. Have you noticed how the light lingers later in the day now? How the sun seems to stop and savor a long, sweet pause on the mountain's sloping shoulders, resisting the call to rest. Over the muddy stubble fields, a pair of northern harriers dip and glide, spiraling closer and closer and lower and lower in a private dance duet. Clouds of red-winged blackbirds click and call from cattails tip, swinging and swaying to a syncopated song. Out in the curve of the horizon, a great blue heron looks to the west, elegantly poised waiting. I swear the sky glowed with greater glory as it lifted its wings wide to ready, a maestro preparing the final movement of this day's symphony. A hush settled across the shadowed marsh as we stood in astonished attention and admiration, while the first silent notes of dusk darkened the evening sky. <clears throat> uh, this is called Encounter. On a table at the coffee shop, left by two ladies, we saw recently depart. The scrape of the chairs, the wrestling arm of coats, the warmth of their lingering full body hugs. In the closed eyes of the man leaning over the bucket of tulips at the front of the grocery store, in that full soul saving breath as he deeply inhales the subtle sweetness amongst the throng and bustle of after work shopping. From the silent rhythm of this hip hop shimmy dance, the messy haired child performs, not caring if anybody watches, while her mother waits, while she waits with her mother in the pharmacy line. You know it has found you when you glow with warmth or breathe more deeply or step more lightly in the afterness of the And this one's very short. <clears throat> it's called Once Again. Outside, on this chilled March morning, spring snow stretches and drapes itself everywhere. Long, cold arms weigh down dark pine branches, tulip shoots, hope. Inside, pea sprouts emerge from damp soil and black, black plastic trays. Trustful, tender green leaves, still folded together, rise to meet the unseen sun. Another ordinary day begins. The next three readers will be Pam, then Austin Gerber, who's actually my senior design buddy at that school, 
And then Brittany, who she might not remember, but she taught me English 2010. I don't know. Yeah. 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 One is called No Time to Be Lonely. Mom, are you lonely in your new house? My daughter asked me last week. <laughs> lonely? I thought, in my cute house? No, no. Uh -uh. I live alone now, but I'm not lonely at all. I suppose I haven't had time to feel lonely yet. My days have been full all summer with vacations, swimming, camping, and getting unpacked and organized in my new home. The kids and grandkids came to visit and everyone loved the place. My sectional couch was quite comfortable when all four adults, two dogs, and two kids took a nap. The other two kids were in the bedroom taking their nap. When they woke up and joined the party, <coughs> the sectional couch was just right for all the toys and dump trucks that came along with them. The time I'd spent looking for a wonderful couch that worked with all the kids and pets paid off well. I'd taken my daughter and grandson with me to check out the furniture. My grandson tested every couch there. It was like a maze of couches at Palmer's. I found time to go for ice cream, go to the park, I went down the water slide and to Bear Lake. I found time for picnics and hit the water park in Millville at least once each week. But I just never did find time to be lonely. My calendar was full of fun dates for lunch, a snack, coffee or gelato, a movie, a party, a concert. But not a minute was spent being lonely. The boxes I unpacked and put away contained little pieces of my life and memories. Each box got sorted and organized, and then empty boxes got recycled. I unpacked dishes, clothes, photos, and fabrics, but didn't unpack any loneliness. When I think back, I must have left it at the old house. Thank you. So I messaged Michael if he could put me on the list, but he didn't check his phone, which goes against everything from his poem. So I'm going to recite the Jabberwocky by uh, Lewis Carroll. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gibble in the wave, all mingy were the borogoves, and the mome rats outraged. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jub-jub bird and shun the frumious bander snatch. He took his warful sword in hand, long time the links and foe he sought, so rested he by the tum tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And while in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came whistling through the toby wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the warful blade went snicker-snack, he left it dead, and with its head, he went galumping back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O proud just day, kalu kale, he chortled in his joy. Twas brilliant, and the slidey toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the mome rats outgrave. <laughs> Does that make me the Sith Lord of the Bolton? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. Anyway, okay. <laughs> um, so I also moved into a new home um, quasi recently. It was last summer. And the three poems I'm going to read tonight, two of them are from before my move, and the last one is from after. Uh, this one is, the first one is titled April 1st. Like a fool, I cleaned the entire apartment. I swept up bouquets of your brown locks, scrubbed and bleached and threw 
the little bits of you away. Then the water table rose. The rain wept in under the front door and change was forced. Again, I found the shape of you in a sock beneath the couch, the holes in the walls behind picture frames like empty eye sockets, scuffs on the floor where your chair strolled around your canvases. I can't buy a new quilt for the bed. I saw them, I fingered them, I tried. I can't look at elderly couples in restaurants without needing to accuse somebody of lying. There is only one pile of laundry now. I can't stand the pristine silence. It's clean enough to shatter. The second poem is titled, On National Reconciliation Day. I ask him if this is a separation or a divorce. In most mirrors, I look forgiven. In the bedroom, a carnation blooms in the shot glass. Daffodils drip brown sludge in the bathroom. Not all of the food in the fridge is expired. Utah's just removed the rape and incest exemption from its freshly shrink-wrapped abortion law. My singularity is a gift. I am childless by choice. The women in my family never got to be me. I have a career. I go to therapy. I should throw a party. I should clean less. I should eat more. I should forgive my body when I catch it looking for your car in the driveway every time I turn the corner home. And the last poem is titled River Heights House. Tonight I keep filling and refilling my teacup. I don't want its warmth to end, but to fill my palms, both palms, like the smooth white heart of this house. After only two weeks, the spider plant slips into emerald green. The old dog sleeps on the new quilt in pools of morning sunlight. I write words that can only be born in the silence of a sober home. This joy has come at such a price. I no longer withhold peace from my life. Thank you. everyone we have on the list for tonight. Uh, is there anyone else you'd like to read? Just if I raise my hand or shout it. <laughs> All right. In that case, uh, thank you to all the open mic readers against my amazing team. And thank you to you, the audience. Uh, this would be really awkward if there was not an audience. <laughs> <laughs> You're an important part of it. To me. Yes. The next Helicon West meeting will be on April 11th, where we will be hearing from our very own Logan City Poet Laureate, Shannon Ballon, who will be giving us a generative writing workshop. Is that here in the library again? And that is here in the library again. So we hope to see you there and uh, drink the coffee if there's any left. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.